on camera. Mr. Dan Holtz, thank you for doing this today. We're going to have a conversation this afternoon, and we want you to tell us your story. Today is Friday, April the 20th, 2018, and we're here at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Frank Luton. I'm a veteran and a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center, and with me is Sue Verhoff, Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the Atlanta History Center. We're here today to record the oral history of Mr. Dan Holtz, who served in the U.S. Air Force Medical Service Corps, Corps in a 25-year service career. Mr. Holtz's oral history is being recorded for the Atlanta History Center's Veterans History Project in partnership with the Library of Congress. And we're certainly honored to have you with us today, Mr. Holtz, and thank you for participating in the project. If at any time you want to take a break during our conversation, all you got to do is let me know. No topic or events are taboo, and please be yourself and use whatever words, phrases, or language you want to use. So we'll start by stating, by if you will state your name, full name and date of birth, and then tell us about your growing up years and how all of that took place leading up to your service. Well, I'm Dan Holtz. Uh, was born in Indianapolis, Indiana, in 1943, April. Uh, in fact, next Wednesday I will celebrate my 75th birthday. Um, was born to my father, Harold Holtz, who was an interior designer by profession and also a uh, organist and pianist, choir director, uh, and my mother, Lois Holtz. She actually, it was Altha Lois Holtz, but she hated that name. So she went by A. Lois, which was kind of interesting, especially since the country started going into first name, middle initial, and she was first initial, middle name. But um, somehow or other, the computers didn't lock her in too quick, and she was able to continue to do that through her her life. Um, so I, as I mentioned, was born and raised there. Uh, graduated from North Central High School up on the north side of town. Um, and initially thought I would go into teaching. And so I applied and became a student at Ball State University. At the time it was Ball State Teachers College and went up there for two years and decided that uh, no, I didn't want to do high school education or whatever. And I thought, well, what am I looking for? And I thought, well, I guess what I'm looking for is a career of some sort. And business attracted me. And so I started looking around at the uh, school of business that they had at Ball State and found out very quickly that it was oriented towards business education. Well, that didn't get me anywhere. I didn't want to be a teacher. So right down the way from where I lived in Indianapolis is a little private school called Butler University. And so I applied to transfer and was accepted and started my studies there. Uh, ended up in the process, I lost a year uh, should have graduated in 65, didn't graduate until 66 because I transferred and changed majors and that put me back a year. But what came out of it that was kind of nice was the guy who became my best friend at Butler, his fiance uh, was at Ball State and he and his fiance invited me to a, an event and set me up on a date with her roommate, who is now my wife, and has been for 53 years this coming August. So, um, and my best friend was my best man at my wedding, and uh, his then wife was my wife's matron of honor. So it was kind of kind of a neat thing. Uh, took college ROTC, Air Force ROTC at Butler, and was commissioned into the 
line back in June of 66. And, but I didn't go into the line. Um, was walking through the ROTC department one day and saw a notice up on a bulletin board and it said, if you're interested in um, a commission in the Air Force Medical Service Corps, uh, fill out an application, letter application, and send it in. And so I went up to the office and said, okay, what have I got to fill out? And they gave me the piece of paper. And I filled it out and I sent it in. And about a month and a half later, I got a very nice letter from the chief of the Air Force Medical Service Corps saying, you've been accepted for uh, a commission in the Me Air Force Medical Service Corps. Oh, okay, what does that mean? Well, it meant that suddenly I went from a regular Air Force officer to a non-combatant Air Force officer, which means I had to be recommissioned, which was kind of interesting. So in July of that year, I was recommissioned into the Medical Service Corps, and in September, um, went to the basic course for Medical Service Administration out at Shepard Air Force Base in Texas, and completed that training, went to Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi for three years, uh, ran the, well, they called it plant management. It was kind of, I had housekeeping, I had maintenance and little projects here and there around the, the place. Um, kept me busy. Hurricane Camille came through while we were there, uh, which was kind of an interesting phenomenon. Uh, we never lost pressure, which was good. Uh, from the standpoint of destruction. There was destruct destruction on the base, but it was all wind that was blowing. We never, you know, you, in a hurricane, when you get to the eye, you, you go into a neutral situation. Well, we never had that happen. That happened because the eye was so small, it was only 14 miles in diameter uh, at about 160 plus miles per hour. Uh, so the winds were blowing and whatnot, and uh, Anyway, we got through that, and three months later, I found myself in Vietnam. Tell me about how you found yourself in Vietnam. How did that happen? Well, I already had been apprised that I had been <laughs> nominated to take an assignment uh, in Vietnam, and that it was going to come up in, well, was November of, 60, of 69. And the assignments people said, okay, this is where you're going to go. And, and then you're going to have a follow-on assignment to the School of Healthcare Sciences at, at Shepherd Air Force Base. Oh, okay. And the assignment was not to an air base in Vietnam. It was to be an advisor to a civilian hospital in the town of Phan Rang, which was in Ninh Thuan province, which is right on the South China Sea. And so that was where I ended up going. I had a, I guess you could say, a rather unique assignment. Um, you know, all of the people that I know in the Atlanta Vietnam Veterans Business Association and other veterans that I know who served in Vietnam basically were all combat oriented or they flew something, uh, either helicopters or fighter jets or, you know, whatever it may have been. My job was to work with this civilian hospital. Uh, it was part of the um, uh, pacification program, if you will, uh, and basically to um, build the infrastructure of the Vietnam economy and the nation so that they could sustain themselves uh, after the U.S. left. And so I got there in uh, November first part of November of 69 and what I found was an old French hospital that was built probably back in the 1920s, uh, open air, nothing like what I was used to <laughs> back in the States. Um, one of the first things I did when I got there was I went the base Fran Rang Air Base was only about six miles away from downtown. And so one of the first things I did when I got there was went out to the base and bought a Pentax camera and <laughs> brought it back and started taking pictures. Because I knew that 
my wife and my par my family would uh, just not believe what I was going to be telling them unless I had something to show them. And so one of the things I, I took was a picture of the, the operating room in this hospital. And it was interesting. Uh, like I said, it was open air. It had windows in it, and they were wide open. Um, you know, the breeze came through. It aerated the place. At least that was the thinking. But there was no air conditioning. There was no way to seal it up anyway. So there was nothing we could do about it, you know, except we went through a lot of antibiotics, <laughs> put it that way. Um, we had, um, there was an open drain in the floor, and it went outside. There was a tube that somebody had put through the wall to allow this thing to drain out onto the backyard. I mean, it, it was interesting health care, and uh, it was a challenge. They had just merged the um, uh, Army of the Republic of Vietnam medical facility that apparently had been located someplace else. I, I never knew exactly where it was, but they had brought the Army folks in and merged them in with the civilians. And so we actually had, I think, about six Vietnamese physicians, three of whom were military, three of whom were civilian. And then on the team that I was assigned to, which was the Military Provincial Health Assistance Program Team 14, that was attached to MACV Cords Team 45, um, was comprised of, I think we had about 17 folks on board. Um, there were, our head, the team lead, uh, and then one other physician, they were both uh, general surgeons. Then we had a, an internist, we had a uh, nurse anesthetist, and then myself. We were the five officers on the team. And everybody else was enlisted. We had a couple of radiology techs, a couple of laboratory techs, a couple of preventive medicine techs, uh, a couple of medical service technicians, uh, ward masters, if you will, under the old terminology. And our job was to try to make this place better, to help them, to give them some skills and techniques. The preventive medicine guys, uh, their function was to basically go out into the various hamlets that were around and try to help them improve their water supplies and, and those kinds of things, uh, which was an interesting thing because um, they'd go out into several of these communities and they'd put these big, huge slabs over the open wells to try to, you know, keep the dirt out of the well. And they put pumps in. And they come back two weeks later, and the slab had been moved off to the side because the people wanted to dip their buckets down in there and get their water out. They couldn't, they couldn't adapt to using the hand pump. You know, so we, we fought that battle the whole time that I was there, the whole year. Um, I don't know that it ever got any better. My guess is that after we left, they probably came in and pulled the thing off and threw it onto the ground and went back to dipping their buckets. I don't know. Um, but we tried. Um, it, was a, it was an interesting assignment um, because I got to, to meet a lot of really interesting people and got to see firsthand the community you know, who we were actually over there trying to help. Um, I sent a tape home to my wife one time shortly after I got there. And I said, I think I just saw the saddest thing that I have seen in Vietnam. I said, there's about six or eight guys, Air Force, this was on the base, standing out at the gate with their cameras with their huge telephoto lenses shooting pictures of there were two Cham temples that were about a mile down the road and these are just brick structures um, I mean you could literally just walk into them and kind of look around about the size of this room that we're in okay so they weren't that big but 
what I just felt was going on was these guys were taking these pictures, getting them developed, sending them home with notes, hey mom, hey dad, this is Vietnam, this is where I'm at. And that's all the farther they ever got was that snapshot. And I just found that to be really kind of sad. And we tried to take people off the base and take them downtown and introduce them to some of the, the local officials and whatnot. And it was just very, very tight. It was a security issue. We understood that. But it was just, you know, like I said, it was kind of sad that these, these young kids, 20 years old or whatever, that was their exposure to Vietnam. You know, and of course the other side of the coin is, is the guys who were out in the foxholes and digging in the trenches and shooting up the jungles and what have you, that whatever they were doing was the other side of the coin. You know, they were right into to everything. And those two things, it was just kind of a juxtaposition. It just kind of kind of struck me as being kind of sad. So, I don't know. One of the more interesting things I mentioned to you when I got my commission, it was I was a non-combatant. We had three compounds, living compounds in Fan Rang. One was the uh, military compound because there were military advisors there as well as civilian. Then there was a civilian compound. We had some agriculture people in there, some economic people, I forget all the backgrounds of some of them, um, to include the, uh, the head of the uh, MACV Team 45, who was a Foreign Service Officer 3, which is a, I guess, a full colonel equivalent in the Foreign Service. And they didn't have any medics. And so somebody came up with the idea we need to put some medics up there. Well, guess what? I was one of them. Okay, if I had to, I could change a bandage. I mean, you know, I wasn't trained as a doing that kind of work. That wasn't what my responsibilities were. Plus, we had one of the surgeons and the internist and the nurse anesthetist. So there were four of us that were up there. Fortunately, we didn't have to, to do anything in terms of, you know, around getting lobbed in or anything like that. Um, but we were up there, and in case the worst case scenario happened, the rest of the team was down at the military uh, compound. Um, and on the back side of the civilian compound was where the spooks were located, CIA. Oops, I shouldn't have said that. Um, everybody knew they were CIA. Um, it was a listening post of some kind. We never knew for sure what they were doing exactly. Um, and just beyond them was a rice paddy field, which I'll get to later. Um, Fan Rang being on the coast, most of the war was happening to our west and to our north. Um, the Ho Chi Minh tra Trail being over on the west side coming down, then the supply train had to bring it all, whatever they were going to bring, to the to the coast. And usually about the only thing that would get through would be mortar rounds, rifle shells, what have you, nothing big. So we'd end up with a lot of little small actions that would be happening around us. And one Friday night, Friday night? No, Thursday night. We were sitting out on the patio. I say we. Uh, psychological, psychological operations guy was there. A uh, young foreign service officer, female, um, who I think her background was agriculture, chemical stuff, whatever, I don't know. Um, and we were watching a movie. There was only about four of us sitting out there. And all of a sudden, we saw off in the distance to the south uh, tracer rounds going back and forth. So we knew something was afoot. We didn't know exactly what. Went over, turned the radio on, started listening to the, what little bit of radio traffic there was. 
between the Technical Operations Center, which was in downtown, about a mile from where our compound was. But it was 12 feet down in the ground. And so this firefight starts and it's going along. And it was apparently between a small Viet, uh, Viet Cong team that had come through the area and the uh, what they called regional uh, popular forces, which were the National Guard defense force, if you will. And they were, they were going back and forth at it probably for a good half hour. And there was a radio call came in that we heard on the radio. And somebody asked if they could get a, a Stinger aircraft, which was the C-1, or excuse me, the C, well, it's the old um, C-47 with the, the guns on the sides. Well, they were all over in the western part of the country at that point in time, even though they were based at Fan Rang. Because the thinking was, well, heck, you know, they're based at Fan Rang. They can probably, you know, lift off and come in and, and help support this thing. Well, there weren't any of them there. There weren't any of the C-130 gunships either. They were all over on the western part of the country. So then this... Um, radio call came in from someone saying, well, I can get you a Hades aircraft. Everybody's looking around on the patio going, what the hell is a Hades aircraft? Well, it turns out it's a air, an aircraft that comes in and drops light attached to parachutes, and it lights up the sky. Okay, so you're going to send one of those in? Yeah. Well, this ought to be interesting. So all of a sudden, I guess about a half an hour later, we looked up in the sky and we saw these lights coming across. And the radio traffic picked up. Hey, we're here. We're at the coordinates. You know, where do you want, you want us to light this thing up? And the guy in the operations center said, well, uh, go ahead and, and drop a couple of flares and, and let's see where you are and then we'll go from there. Well, he lit up Fan Rang. Not the hamlet where the firefight was, but he lit up Fan Rang. Okie dokie. So he, he calls down to the guy on the talk and he says, you know, how's that? And the guy comes out and he says, well, I'm 12 feet down on the ground. He says, I'm going to have to climb out of here and then go check. Well, he checks. He says, well, you just lit up downtown. At which point, non-combatant Dan goes to the radio and I identified myself. I had a, my call sign was 29 Alpha. At that, we changed them about once a month. And I just called into the talk and I said, hey, this is 29 Alpha. I said, I'm sitting here and I'm watching this thing. And yeah, he did. He just lit up Papa Romeo. You know, I can see all kinds of stuff just like it's high noon. He says, and I said, I think I can probably at least get him down to the hamlet. The pilot pops in right away and he says, if you got somebody on the surface that can tell me how to get there, you know, he says, I'll follow his directions. And the guy in the talk says, 29 Alpha, go ahead. So I told the pilot, I said, you know, because I could see him, he's coming toward us. I said, okay, keep coming. Okay, do a right turn. So he does a right turn. And I kind of gauged a little bit. I said, okay, do another right turn. And so he heads, starts heading down south. And I kind of guesstimated where he was in relationship to where I could see the tracers that were going back and forth. And I said, okay, start dropping your flares. And sure enough, he lit up that little hamlet. And I mean, it was daylight down there. Um, and the VC left after about another 15 minutes because the uh, the friendlies had them well sighted. They knew what was going on and where they were and everything else. Well, long story short, like I said, that was on a Thursday night. Friday night, they had a a party down at the Tanhai District compound, which was about 
Well, it was right down on the coast, probably about four and a half, five miles away. And the foreign service officer I mentioned earlier, the young lady, she went to the party and she came back to our compound Saturday afternoon and I saw her that evening and she said, Dan, she said, it was kind of interesting. She said there was a, uh, and I forget what they called these Jeeps that we had over there that had um, 50 caliber machine guns on them. And there were like a crew of four guys that were on each one of these. And they were advisors that were literally down with the troops. And apparently this unit, this, this little Jeep was there, but it wasn't functioning. The radio wouldn't function. And they were trying to call in, you know, and we're here and this is where I need you. And we couldn't say any of that because the thing didn't work. Well, apparently the guy who was the, the, I think he was a captain, was a, the commander of this little group, was sitting at the bar and the foreign service officer was sitting there with him and they were just chatting. And the guy's drinking his beer or something and he says, I'd like to get my hands on that 2-9 Alpha. I don't know who in the hell he is, what he thought he was doing, but we're trying to make contact to get the plane to come in, and he's giving them directions. And yeah, it lit the place up, but it wasn't where we needed it to be lit up. <laughs> and she said, so she told me this, you know, and of course I'm just going, oh, okay, I think I'll just hang my head a little bit low. I don't need to be worrying about this. You know, I'll just stay down at the hospital and let him do his thing. So, um, and then we had another little incident I mentioned right behind the Spooks compound there was a, a, a farm slash rice paddy and we're sitting out again watching the movie on the patio and we heard this zoom. Looked around, what the hell was that? And about 20 seconds later there was a zoom, another one. And we started thinking, hmm, that's not incoming, that's outgoing. What's, you know, going on here? You know, we knew there was no activity in terms of our forces. So, and, and the, the sound, we, we realized it was moving. It was, first one was started over here, and then the second one, and the third one, and the fourth. Ended up about eight or nine of these. What had happened was the VC had come into that rice paddy and set up some... I guess they were 81 millimeter mortars or something along that line. In their typical fashion, put them up on a little tripod of some um, bamboo stakes and light a fuse and run like hell, and uh, which is exactly what they did. And they were walking them in to the province chief's house, which was right in downtown Fan Rang, right next to the hospital. They got within a hundred feet of the front door, <laughs> and that was the last one. Scared everybody, but didn't do any real damage. Um, I think there were maybe a few people that were uh, injured with some shrapnel, but uh, other than that, it was a, a non-event, other than the fact that it was right in our backyard, <laughs> and there, but there was nothing we could do about it. You know, We didn't have the, the wherewithal to... Uh, do anything. I mean, with the the, um, the talk got involved and got the uh, the Arvin folks who were in the area to go out, and they went out into the rice paddy and they found these bamboo stakes that were there. And of course, once the sunlight came up, you know, they confirmed that that's what had happened. And uh, it was just a you know one of those little exciting things that uh, happens in in the life of. Uh, somebody in Vietnam. Um, the being on the coast, the highway between Phan Rang and Cameron Bay, and on up to Nha Trang, was a brand new highway. It was nicely asphalt paved. Uh, you could, and we did. We we'd go up to Cameron probably twice a week, and just you know 
go go shopping or we'd go get some supplies that we couldn't get through our system or what have you and bring them back and 60 miles an hour up the road no sweat we had one incident that i was aware of that one of the we had four vehicles when i left we were two during most of my tour and one day one of the guys well, a couple of the guys were driving up there and they heard something whistle by but it didn't hit the vehicle didn't hit them but they're pretty sure that it was somebody fired around at them um, that was a an interesting thing too we we knew that when we would take care of people at the hospital or if we would go out into the community that we were taking care of VC uh, just that was part of the part of the game if you will uh, they were getting treated by day and trying to kill us by night um, but we had painted on our vehicles Red Cross with right, white background to identify ourselves that hey you know we're medics maybe we'll save ourselves <laughs> we also had um, a red baseball cap and a, I think a red beret if I remember right um, just you know so that we'd kind of stand out as being different and we thought it worked um, the MACV folks uh, put out an edict and said you'll take all those red crosses off of your vehicles because we've got to tone them down and um, you got to stop wearing the the red hats you got to wear the green ones and what have you and be looking like everybody else so that you're not standing out and maybe become a target that was their fear and we're saying well we don't think we're a target we think this is helping protect us and uh, but you know it, it's we took care of we took care of Vietnamese uh, we took care of VC we took care of we had some Americans on a couple of occasions that uh, were involved in a situation that we had a helicopter pad that was near us um, and a chopper brought some injured in and in amongst them was a, were a couple of American advisors and we took them downtown and you know fixed them up and got them back to where they could go back to their unit and go back and do whatever it was they were doing um, but most of what we cared for were the the locals and uh, I think we did a, a good job. I think the people uh, who we worked with appreciated what we were doing and trying to do. Um, I remember when Nixon went into Cambodia back in, I guess it was in May of 70, the war in Phan Rang literally stopped, probably within three days, maybe five. It just came to a halt. There was no more firefights, nothing. Supply line, if you remember, I said, was over at Ho Chi Minh Trail. Mm -hmm. That was on the other side of the country. And so they were, you know, rationing their ammunition, if you will, and concentrating over on that side of the country. And I sent a, I remember sending a tape to my wife and I said, you know, if we stay in Cambodia, the war is over. I said, this is, this is great. Well, what, three weeks later, the pressure here in the States got so bad that Nixon had to pull the troops out. And when he did, and the Ho Chi Minh Trail opened back up, within two weeks, firefights started again. So that was one of the sadder moments, if you will. Uh, I think everybody who was in, on the American side, and of course the, the locals, the Vietnam, Vietnamese, they were very pleased that, you know, hey, maybe we're going to have some normalcy in our lives. And then it started again. And uh, nobody, I don't think, really fully understood why all that was. I think we know now, you know, lo these many years later as to what it, all had happened. But uh, the action itself of going in there, I think, was the right action. If it had been allowed to continue, 
very likely the outcome of what happened over there would have been a lot different. That's just my personal opinion. So that was pretty much Vietnam. When, when did you leave Vietnam to come home? November of 70. Um, did R&R &R in uh, Hawaii back in August of 70. And, uh, did, you, did Linda meet you in Hawaii? Yeah. Yeah, and my then 18-month-old daughter. And uh, so we had a, a nice week. Uh, stayed at Bellows Air Force Station over on the windward side of Oahu uh, where the there was a hurricane or a typhoon, I guess they call them out in the Pacific, that was going through and it went north of Oahu probably about 100 miles. But the surf was up and, I mean, it was kind of interesting. You, didn't, you couldn't go swimming. I mean, you, you could go out to the water, but you didn't want to go swimming for fear that you'd get sucked under. Um, but then got back on the airplane and back to the back to the war. Spiro Agnew was in Guam when we, I think it was when I, yeah, it was when I came back from R&R. &R. And uh, so we got delayed a little bit there because of Air Force Two. And once he got cleared, why, then we got back in the air and flew back into Tonsonut. And uh, it was interesting, too, from the standpoint of just observation. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people have heard the jokes about when the Air Force would set up a base, the first thing they would build would be a golf course, and the second thing was the officers' club. And then they'd go back and ask for more money to put the air fields in. Um, Fan Rang Air Base, just as a good example, had sidewalks, had paved streets, had grass, <laughs> uh, air conditioned hooches, offices. Um, we went over to uh, the Army side of the installation. There was a big hill in the middle and the Aussies had a compound on top of the hill. Actually there were a couple of hills but the big one was where the Aussies were. And they had a swimming pool. It was the only, I think, swimming pool that was anywhere around was at the Aussie compound. But you go over to the, go over the hill and go over to the Army side. Sand streets, no air conditioning, you know, wind was blowing, dust everywhere. You'd go into the post exchange over there and all of the stuff that you would, you know, be looking at to buy, whether it was camera equipment or sound systems or whatever. I mean, that's, you know, that's what people did in their spare time. Um, it was just covered with, you know, run your finger over it and have to dust it off. It was just, and we asked some of the Army guys, you know, what, why not, you know, have a place? Because in, in Tonsonute was the same way. There, there was no air conditioning at Tonsonute in the, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, where the, the battalion that were, they would run people through and then send them out to the field. Um, the yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, right. And, well, we don't want them to get the troops to get accustomed to something really nice because they're going to have to go back out in the field where things or conditions are terrible. So if everything's terrible, they won't have anything to get upset about. Okay. Don't understand Army logic sometimes, but anyway. Um, went to Tonsonute, not Tonsonute, to Saigon several times for meetings. Um, stayed at the Rex Hotel. Uh, it was a nice facility. Um, the uh, the rooms were air conditioned, <laughs> which was nice. Um, didn't want to go to Tonsonute if you didn't have to, but it was just interesting that you know here you got this little base there at Fan Rang. I say little. I mean it's. I guess it was probably on a thousand acres of land, but anyway. Uh, and one side was America. And the other side was not. Just never quite was able to get my arms around that. It just didn't make sense to me. 
but that was the way it was. So, but the the side of the of the action over there that I participated in, I think, uh, while our troops were out fighting in the jungles and what have you, uh, what we were doing, I think it made a lot of difference in the community at Fan Rang and elsewhere. There were 21 of these teams, if I remember, no, I'm sorry, 27. Nine from each of the three services. And the Navy had teams up in the north, up from way down north of Natrang, and then the Air Force had the ones in the middle of the country, and the Army had around uh, Saigon and down in the Delta. And I think, you know, the, the, the services that we provided um, in terms of the, the communities, uh, I think, did a lot of good. Uh, I, I think there was a lot of benefit there, and that's part of the story that you never hear about anymore. Um, I, you know, I think that's one of the biggest objections that a lot of people have to the, to the Burns Novick video is that it doesn't tell that part of the story. Um, and that's unfortunate because it did exist. <laughs> so this was when you returned back to Vietnam. Is what you're talking about now? Well, I mean, part of it was, yeah. After, I mean, after you yeah. had the R and R. Well, yeah. I mean, it. it I'd go out to Phan Rang Air Base probably at least once a week on on business, uh, and while out there, you know, I would go over to the Army side periodically, and you know, so I saw it the whole time I was there. Uh, but it was just that, that juxtaposition. So it wasn't just because of post R and R. It was you know the whole to, the whole and, tour. And how long did you stay this time? How long did you stay before you came permanently back to the states? Oh, uh, from August to November. And what, what year are we talking about? In seventy. Seventy. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask him something? Yeah. I'm sorry, I wasn't making myself clear. So it sounds like you had quite a lot of contact with the South Vietnamese people. Yes. Anything that you'd like to share about your impressions of them, their their culture, things that would you remember that stand out about them? Well, um, I found them to be a very pleasant group of people. Um, they were, I hesitate to use the word humble, but I think to some extent, and it's probably the Oriental culture had something to do with that. But they, they were very, you know, very polite, uh, very interested in imparting to us things that were of enjoyment to them. Um, I remember one night the uh, province senior medical director and his administrator. Um, took the five officers of our team out for dinner and it was a nice little restaurant in downtown Van Rang and of course they knew that our uh, culinary culture was different than theirs and they ordered some appetizers that turned out they were little birds and they were cooked as birds. They weren't gutted or anything else. And they were chomp, 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 chomp. And the five of us are looking at each other. We're looking at the two of them. Don't you want something? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. But um, I enjoyed the, the Vietnamese people. I really did. Um, I've debated about whether or not I ever want to go back and visit. Um, our immediate higher headquarters was up in Natrang, which is a an old French city, uh, beautiful, right on the South China Sea. And at one point in time, with all the villas and everything that are there, probably still to this day, um, 
it was a, a very attractive place to live. Um, and I think it was something that um, if you were to go and visit there as a tourist, you'd probably see that part of the country more so than the, what we saw uh, in terms of the hooches and the huts and what have you. But very attractive country, it really was. Uh, and it was really a shame that you know they had gone through, they went through a millennium of war, basically. I mean, it was just infighting over years, which is why a lot of people say, well, all that was was a civil, civil war. Well, you know, there's more to it than that. But yeah, there had been a lot of uh, fighting going on about, and basically it was tribal. Um, and of course, they'd been oppressed by the Chinese uh, back in the day, too. And so, you know, they, they've, their history was one of fighting, of war, um, which was really kind of unfortunate because here was all this beauty. So when did you leave Vietnam for good? November of November. 70, yeah. And wh where were you when... Uh, when, when the fall of Saigon happened and the, in the end came? Well, Saigon fell in 75. Um, I was actually in a graduate program at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. Okay. Um, I had the opportunity though, well, well, I came back from Vietnam, went to the School of Healthcare Sciences, um, was chief of the plans branch at the school we were responsible for all the curriculum, uh, anything that went on in the classroom had to be documented and we were responsible for all of that. Plus I had a responsibility for something called phase two training. We had, uh, and I think the Air Force still does this, um, radiology technicians, uh, lab technicians, physician assistants, we'd put them out in the field for at least six months so that they got to be PCS as opposed to TUI. Um, and we trained them in real life medicine, real life picture taking, real life laboratories. Uh, after they'd had all of their didactic training at the school at Shepherd. Uh, so I was responsible for, for all of that, um, which was a, an interesting opportunity to, to see, got the opportunity to travel to a lot of different bases and see different medical facilities and, and whatnot. And while I was there, uh, of course, March of 73 came around and all the returning POWs came in. And I'm sitting in my office one day and I get a phone call from the front office and they said, you need to come up here. We've got a job for you. And I'm going, okay. Um, we just got a tasking. You're going to be an escort officer for one of the returning pilots. I said, Excuse me? I'm not a pilot. <laughs> and they said, We understand that, Dan, <laughs> but this is coming down from the front office, the two star. And I'm going, oh, Okay. You know, you're, they went down the roster and they decided they wanted you to be, okay. What does it mean to be an escort? Well, that's what I'm about to tell oh, okay. you. Um, the guy that I got was a fellow by the name of Jim Cutter. He was a captain, had actually been promoted to major uh, while he was a prisoner. He was an F-105 jockey. Um, his plane was blown out from under him uh, over North Vietnam. His uh, back seat apparently was killed. Um, and he was incarcerated, I guess, for probably about 13, 14 months before the end came. And so our job was, they, well, they flew him out of, Thompson, or of uh, Hanoi to Clark in the Philippines. 
They were at Clark for probably five to 10 days, depending on whatever the circumstances were. If their medical condition was such, they might stay longer. Um, at which time they, they got them into uniforms, they got them cleaned up, they got them, you know, looking spiffy. Uh, talked to them for a while, debriefed them as much as they could. And then uh, said, okay, it's time to go back, rejoin your families. And so they would fly them from Clark to Travis, and then from Travis, they disperse out to the various medical facilities around the country, most of which were Air Force, because most of the uh, POWs were Air Force uh, flyers. And so all of the Air Force, what we called then regional hospitals and medical centers, were designated as recipient facilities. Um, Shepherd Air Force Base was a regional hospital. And so it was a recipient facility. And we had, I think, probably about one flight a week was coming into Shepherd. And what they tried to do was geographically disperse everybody as close to where their families were. Uh, for example, Jim's family uh, was from up in Oklahoma. His dad, in fact, was a, a coach at Oklahoma State University. And uh, so that's not that far from Wichita Falls, Texas. So um, when the planes would land, uh, we already would have the families. They'd come in usually the day before. And in fact, we had them out at our house and had dinner and whatnot and, uh, you know, just tried to put them at ease and everything before uh, the big moment. And then we would take them out to the flight line where they would join up with other families that were there. And usually there'd be 20 or so uh, returnees who were coming in on each one of these flights. And of course they went through the, the greetings that you've seen on you know the videos and what have you. Um, some of which were happy, a few of which were not. Um, you know, the guys get off the plane and it's like, where's my wife? My wife wasn't there. And she divorced him and married somebody else because she thought he was dead or other reasons. At any rate, um, then we took them over to the hospital and they would stay at the hospital for usually about three to five more days, get some final checkouts, uh, final debriefings, um, and then they would have a, they say, okay, you've now been cleared. You can go out and have a press conference. And they usually did it three at a time. And the local media plus media out of Dallas, Fort Worth would be there and they'd do their thing. And it usually lasted probably about 45 to minutes to an hour. And they would talk about their experiences, you know, without revealing any classified information uh, because there were, in most cases, still some that had not gotten back there or back from there. Uh, so they had to be very careful what they said. Uh, and then after they completed the press conference, they were on their own basically for like 30 to 60 days leave. And all through this thing, I'm trying to still figure out, what am I doing as an escort officer for an F-105 pilot? I've never been, even been assigned to a base where F-105s were located. So we got to talking to, to Jim and, and Jenny, his wife, what their backgrounds were and everything, and all of a sudden it hit us. You mentioned before we started about Presbyterians. He was Presbyterian. That's the only thing we could ever figure out was the common thing that bonded us. And so, okay. So I guess this was like on a Friday. We had this cathartic moment, if you will. And they wanted to be alone on Saturday. And we went, okay, fine. And uh, so 
Linda and I invited him to go to church with us Sunday morning. So we met him at the at the BOQ, and uh, they had rental cars for him. So they basically just followed us over to, to the church. Well, we walked into the church and went through the, the worship service, but we had already alerted the, the pastor that who Jim and Jenny were and everything. And so um, I had arranged, because we were involved in, with the youth at that congregation, to have Jim do a presentation that night for the youth group sanctuary was packed not just youth i mean it was every church member practically showed up and he talked about the tap codes he talked about you know everything you know it was it was very very interesting uh real eye-opening for a lot of people um particularly the kids uh you know who saw all this stuff on the evening news and didn't really fully understand what it was they were seeing and now here's a guy who lived it and um, but we've Jim and Jenny and Linda and I have kept in touch over the years uh, Jim just passed away about two years ago from Alzheimer's and Jenny is out in New Mexico and so we're still Still good friends, uh, although they're out. West, she's out west. Her kids have married, and they've got kids and whatnot. So it's a, it's been a, a an interesting relationship. But it, the whole function, back to your your question, was just to make them feel at home. You know, uh, help them reorient themselves back into the world, um, which is easy for some and not so easy for others. Uh, I noticed on your uh, resume that you spent quite a quite a long time in England and in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Did you have any experiences in that arena that you, that you might want to share? Well, um, of course, the English. Uh, I went over there as the medical facility commander at uh, Royal Air Force Fairford. And what did you do as in that role? Well, I was the commander of the medical operation for the for the base. Um, RAF Fairford had a unique mission. Um, it was a United States Air Forces Europe base, but its mission was Strategic Air Command. Uh, basically, we had 15 um, tankers assigned at all times to Fairford, but they were rotating. They'd come in for 90 days and rotate back, so it was a constant flow back and forth. And their primary mission, or missions, were to refuel fighter aircraft coming across the Atlantic for deployment to Europe, to support fighter operations in Europe, to support uh, response operations out of Iceland whenever the uh, Soviets would be flying the bear bombers down through uh, between Iceland and uh, Scotland on their way down to Cuba. And the fourth one was we supported the Saudis. Uh, we had two aircraft that were out of the 15 that were down in Saudi Arabia. Uh, of course, this was back in the early 80s when all this was taking place. Um, the pilots and every and the crews were all stateside folks that came over for, like I said, 90 days. Um, and then they'd rotate back and somebody else would come in and replace them. The USAFE folks were the permanent party. Um, so we, we got to know the, the locals quite well. Um, in fact, one of our good friends was one of the brewers over there, uh, Arkell's Brewery. Made some pretty damn good, good beer, too, I'll tell you. Um, the, uh, the wives group that my, my wife was involved in uh, got to be real close with a number of the wives in the local community. Um, being an English speaker in an English-speaking country 
that doesn't speak the same English that we speak, <laughs> on occasion got to be kind of interesting. Um, but the locals loved us, except they didn't like the KC-135 because it was too noisy. The farmers didn't. <laughs> which was always interesting because you'd, you'd, you'd be out on the flight line watching the, the planes take off and all of a sudden they'd do a, a hard bank to the right. And the reason was they were trying to avoid the village just down the way because of the noise issue. And then of course coming in, if they were coming in from the west side, it wasn't a problem because that's basically just farmland out in, on the west side. But if the air currents changed and they had to come in from the east side, they literally had to come in from the south, make a hard bank to the left and land, which was not a fun proposition. So needless to say, the pilots did not like winds coming out of the west. They liked the winds coming out of the east because they could do a, an easy landing. Now taking off wasn't that much of a problem because they had full power and they were, just go ahead and do it. Um, we thoroughly enjoyed England. Uh, my background, uh, I'm German, Scotch, Irish, mostly Scottish, a touch of Irish. Um, and just before we came back in 85, uh, we went up and spent a week up in Scotland and visited the, the Rose Clan castle, because I'm Rose Clan on my mother's side. Uh, little place called Kilrock, but you look at the spelling and it's not Kilrock, it's Kilravak. Uh, but it's right up by, just below Inverness. And in fact, the Culloden battlefield is like about 10 miles away. Hmm. So that was very interesting. And it was interesting for, the, for our two kids because of the, the history. When we went and we toured through the castle, which was actually a Presbyterian um, retreat center, uh, the Laird uh, had basically turned it over to the Church of Scotland for that purpose. Um, but they would have tours on Wednesdays, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And so we got there and just passed the time for the morning tour, so we had lunch. Uh, and then we took the afternoon tour and we were they brought us into this big room and there, I guess there were probably about 25 people who came for this tour and the guy who was the tour guide said, uh, are there any Rose Clan people in the room? Well, three of us put our hands up, my two kids and me. Um, my wife would have because she's married to one, but at any rate, she's not a direct descendant. Um, oh, wow, good, you know. And uh, so he kind of catered to us a little bit, you know. Uh, and of course the Rose family, if you're familiar with um, Rose's Lime Juice, same family, mm. except it's the Australian group. They migrated to Australia and that's what they started was growing limes and created lime juice, which is now sold all over the world. Um, my part of the family came to the States probably back in the 1820s and 30s, 40s, there were several migrations, um, ended up in Illinois. Uh, some of them were in Indiana and my great, great grandmother, I think it was, was, was uh, a rose and then came down through and of course it petered out on our side. So the only ones that are left are over in Illinois. Uh, but that was, it was an interesting experience because of the, the closeness that we had with uh, the RAF people, the Royal Army folks. Uh, we used to go to uh, dinners uh, at Sirencester. There's a Royal Army post at Sirencester uh, where um, Prince Charles plays uh, polo all the time and uh, spent a lot of formal evenings there learning British manners, <laughs> which uh, very formal. Um, and you look at how we do things in the States, you know, 
over there, they told us that if you're done with the meal, just put the fork horizontal on the plate and someone will come and pick it up. And sure enough, I mean, they'd grab it. Well, you try and do that here in the States. You know, people just look at you like, what are you being so neat for? <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, you know, little things that you pick up. We enjoyed the fact that most of the time we were there, the kids got, we, we lived at Royal Air Force Bryce Norton, which is their version of Scott Air Force Base. It's their big transport hub in Oxfordshire. Fairford is actually in Gloucestershire, about 12 miles away, uh, right in the heart of the Cotswold. I mean, uh, beautiful stone houses, businesses, what have you. Um, the community that we lived in was actually built by the Americans back in the 50s because they had B-47s over there. And the B-47 didn't have the transatlantic capability that the B-52 has. And so they had to bring, they brought them all over and then they basically were functioning there where the B-52s didn't have to function there uh, in terms of their strategic missions. They were able to fly transcontinental, be refueled by the refuelers, and go do whatever it was they were going to have to do. The 47 didn't have that capability. Um, so anyway, we had in the, in the little village of Carterton, which is right, butts right up on one side of Bryce Norton, um, probably, I'm going to say a thousand at least, American-built quarters. Well, now they were um, RAF people were living in them because we were there. But there weren't enough quarters on Fairford or at Little Risington, which is um, up north of about 20 miles from uh, the main base. Uh, didn't, didn't have enough quarters between those two locations. So the Brits gave us quarters there at Carterton. So we had British neighbors all around us and got to know them. And, you know, we established some friendships and, and whatnot that uh, are lasting. And if we want to go to Europe, we go to Europe, you know, get on the ferry, go to France. Um, thoroughly enjoyed um, traveling through northern and rural France. My son is the only member of our family who went to Paris. Hated it. Just hated it. And he was only there for three days. <laughs> but he says the French and he says the Parisians are just a bunch of snobs. You know, and he did couldn't speak French, so that was part of the problem. Is you know, if you don't speak French, we're not going to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And you've heard those stories, I'm sure, and they're true. But you go to on the northern part, over towards Normandy and uh, Liege and those areas, couldn't be nicer. Just really, really friendly. Same thing true with the Germans um, over on the western side. Uh, we had a good friend of ours who, in fact, he worked for me uh, in Louisiana, was the clinic administrator at Zweibrücken, which is a little uh, American base, sits up on top of a, a hill right on the, about two miles from the French border. And they call it Sunny Zwei because it's never sunny. <laughs> it's always rainy, it sits in the clouds. Anyway, um, we went there, and, and the German folks in that area are just as nice and friendly as could be. Um, our friends got to, they were living actually downtown, and um, got to be very close with their landlord and, and whatnot. Uh, we enjoyed visiting with them several times. Uh, my wife got into, well, she'd always been involved with Girl Scouting and was involved with it over there. And the original Girl Scout retreat, international retreat, is located in Switzerland, uh, just south of Bern. And so she went over there for a retreat and, of course, got to commiserate with all the American Girl Scout leaders from all over Europe. Uh, from Iceland in the northwest to, you know, 
the Crete, Greece area in the southeast. And that was a, a she really enjoyed that experience. And uh, the Swiss are just as nice as can be. Uh, I went over and to pick her up and stopped, spent the night with our friends in Zweibrücken and then drove down uh, and spent the night in Bern and drove over to Geneva because I wanted to see where the reformers, you know, the, uh, were based uh, and spent the day over there and, you know, didn't speak a word of French, didn't speak a word of German to speak of, but, you know, they all spoke English or enough I could understand them and, they, you know, very, very pleasant, uh, enjoyable, fun people. Um, picked her up, then went back to Bairn that night and then drove down, picked her up the next morning, which was a Saturday, and we took off uh, east, went through Liechtenstein and into Austria and came across that way, ended up in Salzburg and had a wonderful time there. They're just as pleasant as could be. Then we went to Munich and, and back over. So, you know, we, we did a number of, of trips that, you know, but we, we could go whenever we felt like. But in terms of our day to day, the thing that we really enjoyed about Europe was the fact that we were in England and uh, it wasn't this constant, okay, what, what are you saying? You know, do I need a translator? Uh, didn't have to do that uh, most of the time. Um, some some of the colloquial, you know, it's interesting um, as we were talking before the interview about British mysteries and whatnot. Um, we've been watching uh, on uh, Netflix the Shetland series that uh, just completed, and the Scottish brogue is really something and you're trying to piece it together and going wait, wait a minute you know what 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 do you say <laughs> so such is life well tell us about the desert shield and your desert shield and desert storm experience well how'd that happen i was in the pentagon when all of that happened um just to kind of, after when I came back from England, uh, the Air Force sent me to uh, do an education with industry at Arthur D. Little up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I did that for a year and then went to the Air Force Surgeon General's office uh, at Bowling Air Force Base at the time. Uh, was there for about two and a half years. Uh, I was the deputy chief of the Air Force Health Facilities Division for uh, programs. So I got the pleasant task of meeting all the congressmen and their staffers and trying to, to sell Air Force medical projects. Um, and I got promoted to, to full colonel. Well, Dan, you're overgrade for this job. But right now, we don't know where we're going to put you. Okay. So, let's see. I got selected in October of 86. Finally, January 1st of 88 was my official pin-on, although I was actually pinned on the day before. Um, so, I sat there the whole time knowing that, okay, I'm probably going to have to move. But they didn't know where they were going to put me. So I pinned on January 1st, 1988, and was still there in September of that year when the then chief of the Medical Service Corps came in to my office and he said, we found a home for you. I said, okay, where? He says, across the river over at the Pentagon. I said, oh, okay, doing what? Well, there's this program that we inherited from the uh, U.S. Public Health Service. It's called the Uniform Services Treatment Facilities Program. Okay. 
Isn't that the program that nobody in DOD wants? Yeah. <laughs> and you're sending me over there to do what? To run it. Oh, okay. This ought to be interesting. And it was. Um, there were public health service hospitals all up and down both coasts. Uh, going back to the merchant marine days when health care was kind of hard and difficult to find. And President Reagan decided to shut them down because they weren't needed anymore. Because um, health care had proliferated enough that you just didn't need these big behemoths. Well, there was a guy by the name of Scoop Jackson out in Washington State who got pigeonholed one day by the uh, one of the guys at the Seattle Public Health Service Hospital. Hey, we want to continue to take care of military personnel just like they do on the base. So, and, um, there's a lot of them around here, and, 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 and there's about nine of us besides us, total of ten, that want to do this. So Jackson authored a piece of legislation which passed creating these this group of hospitals. And like I said, DOD didn't want them, fought it like mad. Um, and we had 120,000 eligible beneficiaries from Seattle to Boston, Maryland. There was, we had a clinic up in Cleveland, Ohio. Had four facilities down on the coast of Texas, uh, Houston area. Um, and I forget where the others were now. But we provided health care. We, we basically paid for it, is what it boiled down to. And these guys, oh, there was one up in uh, Portland, Maine, called Martin's Point. It was a little outpatient clinic. Lobster was great. Um, we were doing our thing. Everything was rocking along. And these guys decided that they wanted to become an HMO. This was right about the time that the uh, Department of Defense was trying to create what is now known as TRICARE, moving away from Champus and setting up health maintenance organizations and what have you. Now, we want to do this too, but we don't want to do it as part of that. We want to maintain our identity. Well, Congress supported that, so we proceeded to implement the will of the Congress. And <clears throat> surprisingly, I worked for one of the deputy assistant secretaries by the name of Bernie Cappert. Um, and there was another one who was the guy in charge of professional services who was a physician whose name escapes me. And he was the one who was handling the TRICARE piece. Bernie was handling, through me, the USTF piece. Well, we got ours put together and ready for implementation probably about eight months before TRICARE which just frosted that guy over in professional services something fierce. Um, and when we got it all put together, uh, which was in uh, 91, summer of 91, is when I decided to, to put my retirement in. So back up a moment. The Gulf War, Desert Shield, Desert Storm started in August of 1990. And because I was at the Pentagon and doing what I was doing, uh, they decided to hold on to me because I wasn't an Air Force asset at that point. So uh, my Desert Steel, Shield Desert Storm experience basically was there at the Puzzle Palace. Um, kind of got to see it you know, from the periphery. Um, Got to sit in on quite a few meetings that were going on as to you know what the health care support was that was was taking place, but as far as being directly involved in it, I was on the sidelines. Um, 
had several friends of mine from uh, Air Force Surgeon General's office days who had gone over and, and spent time over there as medical facility uh, folks, consultants, what have you, uh, providing support to Schwarzkopf and everything that was happening. And of course, then it was over. Um, but they froze everybody in terms of people getting out at that point in time. Well, they unfroze in, um, I think it was May of 91. And uh, so people started, you know, looking at, you know, whether or not they wanted to stay in or what have you. And a job opportunity popped up in the Washington Post one Sunday and uh, to be the chief financial officer at Columbia Hospital for Women Medical Center. And I thought, what the hell, I'll put my name in, just to see. Well, next thing I knew, a month and a half later, I had a job. And uh, so I retired uh, in August 31st of uh, 1991. How'd you get to Atlanta? Well, Turns out that the guy who was my boss at Columbia Hospital for Women Medical Center and I <coughs> were uh, both retired uh, Medical Service Corps officers from DOD. He was retired Navy, I was retired Air Force. We were too much alike. He was the boss, so I left. And uh, so I started job hunting, did some consulting work for a while there in the D.C. area, working with DOD contractors. And finally uh, hooked up with Quorum Health Resources, uh, which is a hospital management company based in Brentwood, Tennessee. And they said, yeah, we want to put you on and, and everything, and we'll get in touch with you when something comes up. Okay. So I get a phone call one evening um, that, hey, we've got a assignment at a little uh, town about 100 miles away from Atlanta. Uh, it's an interim assignment. Uh, would you be interested in, in doing it? And I said, well, okay, yeah. So I came to Sparta, Georgia in October of 1993 for an interim assignment. They, the board of the, well, the hospital was a hospital authority hospital, which in Georgia means it's a quasi-governmental entity. But because of the local politics in Hancock County, Georgia, which is a uh, heavily minority county, uh, population's only about 10,000 in the county, and 85% is minority. Um, the politics being such, uh, they decided that uh, they just couldn't, the hospital authority just couldn't run it because it was just, they couldn't agree on things. So they created this hospital corporation that actually became the day-to-day -day operator of the facility. And <clears throat> they ran it for probably about 10 years with their own people that they hired to include the um, administrator slash CEO and then they started having financial problems and couldn't find somebody to become the administrator and that's how quorum came into the picture and our job was to go in as to be the managers um, and the um, well quorum had several different models one of which was the uh, administrator the chief nurse and the chief financial officer all worked for quorum. Well, the locals didn't want to do that, so we ended up, I was the only quorum guy on site, and uh, so we worked with the corporation, and everything was working fine for about five years, and uh, some of the locals on the hospital authority decided that uh, they could do a better job of running it than what we were, and unfortunately, this was right about the time that the uh, federal government was really ratcheting down with Medicare and 
uh, HMOs were really coming to the fore, and so you know you'd negotiate a, a deal with somebody, and they were trying to just you know really squeeze you as tight as they could squeeze you. And they these folks just didn't understand the economics of of healthcare in uh, 1998, 1997, 98, and on the 6th of March of 1998, my phone rang in the office and it was the president of the local bank and she says, I don't know what's going on, Dan, but uh, the guy who's the head of the hospital authority was just in here asking a bunch of questions about the bank accounts. Okay. Thanks, Ann. I appreciate it. Keep an eye on what's going on. And I guess it was about 30 minutes later, the county sheriff walks in the door, along with this guy who was the head of the hospital authority, and their attorney. And their attorney says, uh, you need to vacate the place. We're taking it back over. I said, excuse me? And the sheriff is standing there, and I'm going, Slim, what's going on here? <laughs> and Slim didn't say anything. He, says, he just stood there. So I packed up my immediate stuff and I left. Went to the house, started making phone calls. And we ended up, the, the corporation fought it for a while. Um, we ran into a judge uh, in the Akmogi circuit who I think was trying to protect her election, re-election capabilities. So she sided with the, the locals who thought they could do a better job of running it. Bottom line was 18 months after the corporation pulled out, and of course we pulled out when the corporation pulled out, um, the hospital was dead. It was a nice facility, 52 beds. It still is a nice facility, except that, you know, they, they've pulled everything out. It's, it's in bad shape, what's left. It's just a shell, but it's a waste. Um, the current chairman of the county commission down there, we still own a home down there. Uh, got an old antebellum house that we bought uh, back Is that in the day. when you migrated to the Department of Veterans Services? Yeah, we, I did that. Um, well, I actually came on board with the department in December of 99 and was down at the veterans home there for 10 years and then got a promotion and came up to Atlanta as the assistant commissioner. So, What does the Department of uh, Veterans Services do for the state? What do they do? Are we still on? Do you want me to pause it? What time is it? Three o'clock. Three o'clock. Do we need to pause? Yeah. Okay. All right. I think we left off with the um, the dismantling of the <laughs> hospital down there. So once that happened, what was your next your next? Uh, well, my move? my next move was to, f to find a job, and uh, the uh, the gal who was my uh, medical records director and utilization review gal and whatnot. Her husband uh, was the office manager for the Georgia Department of Veterans Service in Milledgeville. And she and I, well, she finally got to a point after about, I guess, four or five months where she, she'd had it up to, to here with these folks and she just said, I'm out of here. And uh, so we both ended up, uh, I guess it was in Early '99, May, April, May time frame, we both went to work as uh, agents for Aflac, and um, I hated it. No offense to Aflac, uh, it just <laughs> it, selling insurance is not my bag. And um, anyway, um, I guess it was in November of that year. Uh, Ernie called me and he said, "Do you know anybody who'd be interested in a?" A job working over here. We've got this um, technical representative of the contractor 
type position that is here that we have to have. And, uh, you know, if you know somebody that, you know, might be interested in doing this, you know, let me know. Said, okay. Called him back the next day. I said, yeah, me. <laughs> and uh, so I had an interview about a week and a half later and was hired on the spot and started to work on the 9th of December of that year and uh, been with the department ever since. And so uh, but I did 10 years uh, down there. Uh, the guy who hired me retired the end of uh, 2000. And when he did, all of the construction stuff that the department does, which is basically at the two veterans homes. And at that point in time, we were just building our first state veterans cemetery down in Milledgeville. So all of that came down to Milledgeville and I inherited it. And so we created uh, what we now call the Health and Memorials Division, which is located down at Milledgeville. Um, and of course, we now have the second cemetery down in Glenville, right behind Fort Stewart. Um, so that's a, that's a thriving little operation down there. Um, and I know you, that uh, one of the things that we've been working real hard at for the last probably three years is to develop a uh, subacute rehabilitation therapy unit at the home in Milledgeville to uh, take care of people who are suffering from PTSD, TBI, uh, multiple amputee types things, primarily focusing on Afghanistan, Iraq veterans, but not totally. Um, the thought being, if there's somebody, you know, from my generation, from Vietnam, who's, you know, maybe now no longer working in the PTSD that's been there all along, but was masked, is now starting to manifest itself, um, you know, maybe we can help them. Uh, the only connection that or the, the only requirement really, uh, well, you have to be a resident of Georgia for two years or any five years out of the last 15. So if you get through that hurdle, you know, then the next hurdle is you must be service connected disabled because the funding for this is going to be 100% from the VA, and that's the reason that we're doing that. Uh, otherwise, we'd have to use state appropriations for 50% of it, roughly. So we want to use that payment mechanism and, and as a basis for making this thing work. And according to our uh, research that we've done with uh, the Southeast Medical Network for the VA, which is um, Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina, uh, how soon can you open the doors? You know, we, we got patients, we'd love to send you. Because they are constricted by time limits. They're on a 90-day window. And so once you reach that 90 days, I mean, they, they can extend it another 90, usually without too much trouble. But you get to that point where, you know, we've done all we can do for you. Well, they're still not where they ought to be or where they want to be. Um, we don't have that limit under the the payment me mechanisms for the state homes, there's there's no time limit on it because the focus is, you know, we're talking about nursing homes um, as opposed to acute providers of, of health care with a nursing home off to the side. Um, the concept seems to work on paper. Uh, I think it will work once we get everything lined up. Uh, the renovations to the uh, Russell building down at the home in Milledgeville are probably about two-thirds of the way complete. And we're looking to open it up probably in 19. And <clears throat> we'll see how it goes from there. Uh, it's not going to be a cheap operation because we're going to have to have a psychiatrist on board, uh, probably a couple of psychologists some uh, rehabilitation type people who are um, trained in mental health issues, uh, nursing staff that's going to have to be trained in dealing with uh, patients who have PTSD, TBI type problems. Um, so it's, it's going to be a little on the expensive side. Uh, we had a meeting with um, the folks at the uh, governor's office of planning and budget 
I guess it's probably about a year and a half ago now. And the guy who was there uh, for OPB said, well, he's looking at these numbers and he's saying, you're going to rob all the medical people out of the state prison system with these salaries. And we just looked at him and said, well, what can I say? You know, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. We're going to do it first class. Oh, yeah, but what are we going to do about them? I said, geez, Rick, I don't know what you're going to do about them. <laughs> you know, I'm not worried about them. That's somebody else's problem. Um, but I think it's, it, it's, it's something that no other state's doing this. Uh, the recent situation out in California um, where they had the, the three people who were, were killed. Uh, it's sort of, they were trying to do something similar, except that it's a different way of doing it. It's um, some kind of a, of a contract using the facility, uh, and it's, it's a mixture of VA and contractor people, but not state people out there. And the three people that were killed, one of them was a VA employee, uh, which is probably a little known fact. Not everybody, I think, is aware of that. Um, but we're the only state that has gone out and said, what we want to do is take advantage of the fact that we've got resources available. There's this need out there. And probably over the next 10, 20 years, I think more states are going to have to step up and do this uh, because the nature of the injuries that have come out of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan are such that, yeah, we've saved them on the battlefield. Um, we've returned them back to their families, but they're a different breed of medical problems. Yeah, you've got the the blood and the guts and all of that is there. But because of the capabilities of modern medicine, you can take care of that. But then what do you do? And that's what we're looking to do, is to address those issues that are actually there all along but don't manifest themselves until, you know, maybe six weeks after they get out of service and suddenly they're looking around and saying, you know, what's going on, you know? And, you know, they're starting to drink and uh, too much alcohol and going out and buying a gun and what are you doing with that and, you know, the, all, all these kinds of issues. And so part of what we're going to be doing as part of this program is to, to teach and work with the families too, not just, not just the veterans. And, uh, you know, I... I before we swapped out moderators here, <laughs> where he was headed, he was asking, because we talked briefly before the, the conversation began, about, you know, what, what are my thoughts about, you know, what's going on with the VA today? First of all, let me just clarify something so everybody understands what our role is. We are the state VA, if you will. Our role is to advocate for veterans. We assist them in filing claims. Uh, that's our big... That's our number one mission. We assist them in appeals of uh, decisions the VA makes that they don't like. Yes, we do provide health care benefits at the nursing home level, and we do provide memorial benefits at our two cemeteries. But our primary focus is claims and appeals, and we're an advocate. But our partner in all of this is the VA. Uh, we can't do what we do without the VA doing what they're doing. And I see right now, at least locally, the, the VA is trying to fix the access issues. They're trying to fix the backlog issues. They just don't have the resources to, to really do what's going to ultimately have to be done. Um, I hate to say throw money at it because that may or may not be the answer. Um, it's part of the answer. 
Uh, I think access has gotten better uh, from what we're seeing. Uh, what we're hearing from the, the veteran population is that once you get inside the door, if you've got a medical issue, the care is fantastic. It's the getting inside the door that's the problem. Um, but I think that their heart and their mind is do, to do the right thing and they're, and they're working to do the right thing. And a lot of the complaints that we hear today, they're individual anecdotal type situations. Um, and to some extent, they're getting blown out of proportion. Uh, it's not to say that they don't exist. It's not to say that the people who have been affected in these situations haven't been hurt in some way. Um, but it's not as systemic as it was probably three, four years ago. Um, you know, we hear rumors periodically that there's um, a lot of pressure being put on VA personnel to, to do certain things, uh, a lot of peer pressure, you know, cover up stuff, but it's, it's less and less. There, there was more of this going on three, four, five, six years ago than there is today. Um, I know the people that they have in place in the, or did have in place in the three medical centers here in Georgia. I say that because two of them have retired, uh, one at Augusta and one, and one at Dublin just retired here about a week and a half ago. Um, and the lady out here at Atlanta VA Medical Center, uh, she's a fantastic person. And the network director is, uh, was the director out here at the Atlanta VA. Fantastic lady. They've got their heads screwed on right. And they are doing, I think, everything within their capability to provide the care and the services that, that the veterans are looking for. Um, you know, Augusta is different than Atlanta, but it's... Um, similar in that it's in a metropolitan area, second largest city in the state of Georgia. Uh, Atlanta, I mean, that's the, that's the population hub of the state of, of Georgia, no doubt about it. And what you are seeing out there is just a mass of humanity that are trying to, that's trying to use that facility. Um, I think over time that's going to drop off, not just because of uh, the passing of World War II and Korea veterans, although that's part of it, but the fact that Fort McPherson is no longer operational. Um, it's, Atlanta's not the retirement hub mm -hmm. that it used to be. Um, it never has been that big a retirement hub for people in the Air Force because there's not an Air Force base nearby. The nearest Air Force base is Warner Robins. Uh, not discounting Dobbins, but you know, Dobbins, and of course the active duty mission at Dobbins closed at the same time that Fort McPherson did. So what you've got is the Air Reserve base out there. Um, but it's, you know, its services are extremely limited uh, and very non-active duty focused. So, I think over time, you're going to see the population of veterans starting to drop uh, just because there's, uh, there's not an active duty mission nearby. The nearest mission is either um, Robbins Air Force Base or Fort Benning. Uh, Fort Gordon, I mean, it's not that much farther away, but it's, you know, basically 150 miles. Um, there's been some talk. I saw something in the newspaper not long ago about some kind of a new cyber or something or other, not the cyber command at, at, at Augusta, but something infrastructure type thing for the Army, uh, conceptual development or something that Johnny Isaacson is, is 
I guess he and David Perdue are pushing to maybe get it, if they're going to do this, to get it located in the Atlanta area. Um, if that were to come about, then you'd see something to take off again. Um, but until that happens, my projection, my prediction is that probably in the next 15 years, the military population here is going to drop off quite a bit. Uh, unless people come in and, you know, because they're working for some major company, um, the, the attraction isn't here. Uh, when Fort Mac was out there, you had a steady pool of retired military people who were, had settled here, liked the area. I mean, the area's nice, no doubt about it. Uh, my wife and I are obviously not Georgians by birth. Um, my wife was actually born in right outside Detroit, Michigan. Her dad was with the Weather Bureau and moved around many, many years, uh, ultimately retired in Fort Wayne, Indiana, which is how we met is because of our college connection at that point in time. And I was a homeboy. I mean, my parents were from southwest Indiana and came up to Indianapolis back in the Depression and stayed. And so it was after Linda and I got married that uh, we started moving around and uh, ended up being assigned to every state that bordered the Gulf of Mexico and on the Gulf twice, Biloxi and Panama City, um, with a a brief interruption in Vietnam and a little bit longer interruption in Europe. So, um, we've had, you know, we've had a good life, and uh, I'm very pleased and satisfied with the service that I've done on my active duty time. And and since then, um, this is. People ask me, well, what do you do for a living? What, what, what profession are you in? Well, I'm a trained health care executive. I'm a life fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives, which means I'm not practicing anymore. Well, what are you doing? Well, I help veterans. Not, not directly, but because my focus is the two homes, the two cemeteries, and administration. So I've got the budget, I've got personnel, you know, I have all these cats and dogs that if I weren't doing what I'm doing in those areas, the folks that are doing the direct service to the veterans in the state of Georgia, from the far north up in Lafayette to the southeast down in St. Mary's and 48 other in-between locations, um, wouldn't be able to do their jobs. So it, it's, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. So it's a, it's a fun thing. And people say, well, when are you going to retire? Well, when I'm not having fun anymore, when I'm not enjoying what I'm doing, and if and when my health gets bad. So as long as those three things are positive, I'll probably stick around. Yeah, but why? Don't you want to travel? Linda and I aren't the traveling kind, I guess. So we enjoy, we're not stay at home, but, you know, we tend to stick around, so. Well, you should be proud of the service that you've rendered. You're in a unique position, I think, mm -hmm. having been active duty for so many years, yeah. and then now reaching back in your status as a sort of civilian, sorta, to uh, <laughs> you know to help again. Yeah. Um, and you're right. The the conflict that we've got going on now is unusual in its um, in its duration. Um, these yeah. men and women that go back for multiple tours. Totally um, different than, than yes. what it was in World War II, Korea, and, and what I saw in Vietnam. Yep. Um, although I guess we were kind of the transition. Uh, we were going back and forth you know, as individuals because uh, yep. when I did my tour in Vietnam, you know, I was the only one on the airplane that was, was going to be doing what I was doing. And people, we, we probably transferred, I guess out of 17 people, we were probably processing at least one a month yeah. um, back and forth. Yeah. Um, 
and that's not the case anymore. I mean, now they're back to the to the unit concept, yes. except that they're doing short-term deployments, mm -hmm. which okay. And you know. repeatedly. Yeah. 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 So. Well, one thing we like to do um, before we close the interview today is kind of give, offer you an opportunity to pontificate in any which way that you'd like. If there's anything that you haven't said that you'd like to share or just anything that you'd like to say, because this is for your family mm -hmm. also. Um, <laughs> I've had a, a very blessed life. It's not over yet. Uh, I think I still got a few years to go. Um, neither of my kids elected to follow in my footsteps. Um, and that's fine. Um, my son is up in the DC area. He's in the heating, air conditioning, ventilation business. Uh, seems to thoroughly enjoy it. Um, has decided that uh, the bachelor life is for him. Okay, whatever. It's his life. Uh, my daughter is up in Durham, North Carolina. She married a, a Brit uh, who she did not know when we lived there. Uh, they met on the internet and they seem to be uh, doing quite well. Um, my wife and I, she's retired now, has been I guess since oh, 10, 2010, yeah, thereabouts. Um, but she's very, very active in, in our church and uh, is the, the lead of the um, knitting ministry at our church where they knit caps for cancer patients and young newborns and um, various and sundry other things. Uh, which is a a very good ministry for them. Um, I've always been, because of my dad's background, he was, a, as I mentioned way back in the early part of this, uh, an organist choir director uh, as an avocation for, geez, 40 plus years. Um, I've always been a singer and uh, primarily church choirs, uh, although since we moved to Douglasville, I got involved in the uh, West Atlanta Douglas Choral Society, and uh, that's been an interesting experience. Uh, it's been a real blessing from the standpoint with the 50th, uh, the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War. Um, the uh, state of Georgia has had ceremonies at the state capitol, many of which have been uh, involving Governor Deal, and uh, he's been very supportive of, uh, of this whole effort. Um, and we were looking around when we were starting this uh, back in, let's see, it's been what, five years, so what's that, 13. Um, we were looking for what can we do musically and I said, hey, I know this group on the western part of the Atlanta metro area. Uh, let me see what we can do. And uh, they have been involved with us since the get-go. Um, but it's, uh, and I've found myself either as the master of ceremonies and the director of the, of the chorale saying, but you need to be up here singing too. Well, I don't have my zoot suit on, you know. I'm sitting here, you know, in my in my blazer and whatever, you know, playing master of ceremony. Yeah, well, just just come in and join with us. Okay. Well, whatever. Um, but it's that has been a an interesting experience, um, and they they have appreciated as a group and individually. Uh, the opportunity to to meet a lot of Vietnam veterans and to just chat with them briefly and um, I think one of the most uh, moving ceremonies that we had was the one that was recognizing uh, those who didn't make it back and we had families 
that came, I think, from as far away as Arizona. That uh, I think it was a granddaughter uh, found out about it, and she hopped on an airplane, and and she was there, and. Uh, it was a very moving experience for her. It was a very moving experience for everybody else that you know all these family members had had come to this, and it was you know, it was family members of Georgians who had not made it back. Um, so I f consider myself very very lucky that I've had this opportunity to um, go beyond just my military career. And uh, I tried the civilian market, I enjoyed it. Uh, my experience out in Sparta was unique <laughs> at best. Um, we still have a lot of friends out there, by the way. And like I said, I still own a home out there. Uh, you wanna buy an antebellum home? I got, got one for sale here momentarily. I'm doing having, having some renovations done right at the moment, but that will be done here shortly. Um, And we, we cherish those friendships, but we're very happy up in the Atlanta area. Um, there's a, a lot of places in this green earth that are not as nice as, as this area. And Douglasville is, it's close. It's, it's got a small town feel to it, but yet, you know, I drive back and forth every day, 24 miles door to door. Um, it's not that bad a drive. It was 24 miles from my house in Sparta to my desk in Milledgeville. The traffic was different, um, but I know the back way. So I, if 20 backs up, I just take the back way and usually make it to work on about the same time. So, uh, but I think um, I'm, I'm very thankful for my wife, uh, for the 53 years that we've had together. Uh, hopefully we'll, maybe not another 53 years, that might be a little bit too long. Uh, but, you know, whatever, you know, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, not that we won't at some point in time say, okay, enough is enough and let's do a little bit of traveling and at least spend, you know, more time with the kids and visiting. And, uh, which we may do, we'll just have to see, so. Well, we wanna thank you for taking the time to come in today on behalf of the Atlanta History Center and the Veterans History Project and the Atlanta Vietnam Veterans Business Association. We're grateful that you took the time yeah. to share your story. And if I might just say thank you for your service, welcome home, and thank you for all you continue to do yeah. to make veterans' lives better. So we appreciate you very much. Thank you. Thanks.